Hi, welcome back. My name is Joel Duff, and today I want to talk about reactions of young earth creationists to evidence of specimens preserved in fossilized tree resin. Okay, I just want an excuse to talk about amber. Uh, amber is such a cool type of fossil. In particular, I want to talk about Burmese amber, or as it's known today now as Myanmar uh, amber. That refers to the location where this particular amber is found. So what is amber? Well, as I alluded to in the title, amber is the fossilized version of tree resin. Not to be confused with tree sap, all right? Tree resin is a different, uh, biochemically different substance that is produced in the outer bark of some trees. Think of pine trees. I mean, there's a reason why you don't climb up into pine trees is because you're gonna get covered with that sticky, what is often called sap, but it's actually resin from the tree. That resin is has a antimicrobial and uh, I guess you could call it function, antifungal function. Uh, you can think of it as the immune system of the tree. When the tree gets damaged in any way, that resin then oozes out and forms a barrier, not allowing other insects and even bacteria and fungi to survive and be able to get into the tree and, and potentially cause an infection in that particular tree. If that resin, and you're showing, I'm showing here some polished resin, what was resin and now is amber, these are rocks, uh, they've been preserved over time. If that resin uh, were to fall to the ground uh, and then get preserved in say a flood or something like that, uh, you might find that uh, that resin has a chance to uh, transform itself into this rock version of resin, uh, which we call amber. Hey, it's, and you know, resin is sticky stuff, and so organisms that get trapped in the resin when the tree produces it are going to be trapped in it during the fossilization process as well, and they are going to get fossilized along with the organic, organic compounds of the, of the tree resin. And you get amazing preservation. This is what's so incredible about amber is that it, 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 when we say it's a window into the past, I mean, it literally is like a window in the past because the resin or the what becomes amber then is this uh, clear, often translucent uh, rock, uh, which is sold for gemstones, um, telling you something about the clarity of it and the, and the, the, the color. Um, you can see through this particular rock and inside you'll see the trapped remains of other things that have been stuck inside of it. Um, now having a lot of animals and other junk inside of the resin probably isn't good for its gemstone quality right, and properties, but uh, scientists love it when they find a piece of amber that has other stuff uh, stuck inside because that is truly our window into the past. Um, in this case, you're seeing a piece of amber that has obvious uh, ants in it. Here's a couple ants right here. Uh, and it's got this crazy uh, long structure here with all these filaments off it. Those are feathers. Um, this is a very famous piece of amber because it has the, the uh, remains of a tiny bony tail uh, that comes from some kind of dinosaur or dinosaur slash bird uh, that has these preserved feathers on it, uh, amongst other things. Um, and just to, just to show how the, the clarity of amber and the remarkable preservation of organisms inside. And so we can learn so much at very, very fine detail of anatomy, um, right? All the soft tissues of these organisms are preserved uh, for us inside of this amber. Um, so I want to talk though specifically about one piece of amber that was recently reported upon and that's this piece of amber here. It's only about an inch and a half wide. Uh, there are portions of more than 40 different organisms found in this one piece of amber, but we want to focus on one, and then I want to highlight a couple others. And that one would be this thing right here. Kind of looks like a coiled snail shell, but this isn't a snail, it's an ammonite. Um, before I tell you more about ammonites, let me also circle a couple other things here. These are gastropods. And these gastropods are also, uh, um, ammonites are, are um, marine animals, uh, and, gastro and gastropods also were marine animals as well. There's a bunch of other insects in here as well, and plant material. So this particular piece of amber has an interesting mix of terrestrial organisms and aquatic, and specifically marine organisms. And this particular ammonite is the first time an, anim, an ammonite has been found inside of amber. Um, 
Now, the coming together of terrestrial and um, marine organisms in a single piece of resin, resin that must have been produced in a terrestrial environment, at least it was formed on a tree, uh, and that tree producing resin was, you know, at best near a beach. Uh, you know, has been highlighted in various creation articles as evidence that uh, there was a chaotic global flood because how else could you get terrestrial things and marine things together inside of one piece of amber, right? How could you get an ammonite which lives in the ocean into a piece of amber from a tree that lives on land? Uh, their proposal is that uh, the only way this could happen is you must have had some kind of chaotic, and they're, in, in, in they're thinking, a global flood that created the conditions that would uh, give us the rock we have before us. And so this is evidence, all right, of a global flood, and therefore is evidence of the Noahic flood, which they say is 4,350 years ago. So I want to look at that. I want to look at the Young Earth Creation Statements uh, and then provide a little bit more detail and analyze some of their statements. Before I do that, I need to talk a little bit about ammonites. All right, ammonites are an organism that existed from the Devonian period uh, up through the end of Cretaceous, and then they suddenly disappear. There's tens of thousands of different species that have been identified in the fossil record. Uh, they come in all kinds of interesting shapes and forms, but they almost all are coiled. Uh, there are some straight versions you see over here. Um, I have uh, a particular set at home, a uh, fossilized set that's a uh, pirateized uh, fossil that looks very much like this pair right here. Um, and ammonites are, as you might guess, they're related to cephalopods, um, so squid and octopi. Um, but this is an entire group of cephalopods that no longer exist, and they went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous, which might sound familiar, that's the time in which the dinosaurs also went extinct. So when they talk about a mass extinction event, um, there's all different kinds of organisms that go extinct at that point in time in the fossil record. Um, oh yeah, so I was saying from the Devonian, so right here, the very first ones are found, and then we go up here, and none have been found uh, above the Cretaceous. There's also a pattern to them, too. There's some very simple uh, uh, ammonites uh, in the Devonian, and then it's not until you get up to the Cretaceous and Jurassic that you have the enormous ones, because some of these came and they were, they were more than a meter uh, wide in size in terms of their coils. Um, and also incredibly diverse uh, in the Jurassic, uh, many more different varieties and forms uh, at that time. All right, but we recognize that they're, or paleontologists recognize that these were all marine organisms. Uh, they're all preserved in marine environments, so hence highlighting the uniqueness of this particular fossil because you have an ammonite that's trapped in amber, which looks like it's a non-marine environment. And so young earth creationists have caught on to that, they've noticed that particular uh, uh, report uh, and have snatched that up as, you know, promoting their particular cause or their particular beliefs. So here's the original paper in the, in, uh, the Proceedings of National Academy of Science, an ammonite trapped in Burmese amber, uh, where they talk about all the different fossils, all the different organisms that are in this piece of amber, but they highlight this particular ammonite because it's so interesting, and they provide a couple different scenarios for how this could have happened. Um, and the primary one would be that um, this ammonite, um, one thing we do know from the location where, these, where this amber is found is that this amber is found in different lenses of, of rock layers, uh, many of which are sort of sandstones from, from beachy areas, but there's also layers of, of coal uh, and so it looks like a swampy intertidal region, all right? Uh, and so you would say that, or an estuary area, all right? That's where the ocean and the land uh, meet. Uh, and so you'd have tides moving up into uh, maybe these forested regions. Um, maybe you had higher forests in some areas where there was less um, marine environment, but nonetheless you could have large tsunamis or something like that that would bring up material and lay it up underneath the forest. Um, and so what they propose is that you have the amber, the resin, all right, it's going to become amber later, the, the resin uh, produced by a particular form of extinct uh, gymnosperm, which is also known in the fossil record in that particular area. And that particular uh, uh, resin then would have trapped, as it's produced, would have trapped insects in it that were common to that particular time period. 
uh, and other paleontologists have confirmed that the types of insects found in other places in the world around that time are similar to the ones in this particular rock. And then maybe that amber then falls down to the, I'm sorry, that resin falls to the ground, right? Big blob of it. These are usually, you know, one inch to two inch in diameter chunks, all right? Falls down to the ground. And if on the ground there is leaf litter and maybe there are shells on the ground and it just lands on a couple shells, it would then absorb those shells into the amber as it sits there and it could become preserved. Now I have to point out one really important thing, which I didn't say before in this picture is, this particular ammonite and the gastropods, which are both marine, um, neither of them are were living at the time that they were trapped in this resin. Whereas the insects were undoubtedly alive, or at least uh, had been alive very soon before they, they got stuck in the amber. Uh, but this particular ammonite, we know from looking through with other kind of microscopy that this is just full of sand and the gastropods also have sand in them. So they look like they're beach shells, not living things that are living in a marine environment and getting trapped. Uh, they look like they're shells that have been washed up on shore, right? So that makes it seem, you know, that makes it seem more plausible, right? That you would end up with marine things mixed with terrestrial things inside one piece of uh, material. Um, so, Let's get right to it. I said let's get right to it earlier, right? Like 10 minutes ago. Let's get to the creationist uh, responses to this particular, you know, like how are they using and presenting, what I'm most interested in, how are they presenting this particular fossil to their audience? What impression are they giving their audience about the nature of this fossil? Um, and so I think we can see that in two different articles. One was the one where I noticed it because it was just published recently uh, digitally uh, at creation.com, which is the digital um, uh, arm of Creation Ministries International from Atlanta, Georgia. And um, they have this article, Ammonite in Amber, right? Published in creation.com, their, their journal, uh, sort of for public uh, consumption journal. And it's by uh, this Philip uh, Robinson. And he goes on to say, well, Amber uh, offers incredible insights into the past due to their snapshots of life, often captured in fossilized truth. Exactly right. One such Amber insight has left evolutionist scientists, it's a tongue twister there, evolutionist scientists confused and unable to provide a suitable account for the presence of the sea creature contained within it. I already gave you a bit of an account uh, of how this could possibly happen. And I don't really feel terribly confused or unable to provide any uh, account for it. Nonetheless, this is, this is they're saying, look, you can't explain, this fossil can't be explained in the conventional geological way. Now, he's using the word evolutionist scientist, but evolution doesn't really necessarily have anything to do with this particular uh, case. I and mean, we're talking about um, the existence of a fossil and how it came to be. It's really talking about the age of the Earth more so than, uh, than evolution. This is just a pejorative term thrown in to say, like, those who we disagree with, right? Uh, well, before I go on, let's look at this uh, Philip Robinson. I didn't know who that was. So who, it, who is it that's writing about this and analyzing and interpreting this particular evidence? Um, Phil Robinson um, got a bachelor's in education, uh, in religious studies, and he has a Master's of Divinity from Union Theological College. All right, so that's his background. I'm saying not a science background at all. Uh, and so I think it's just important that you understand um, the types of expertise that the author has here in terms of being able to interpret the original literature, but then also frame it in the context of young earth creationism. Um, he is neither an expert really in both, um, and yet is writing this article for uh, a, a journal that's going to be sent out to tens of thousands of people, if not 100,000 uh, individuals that will eventually see it. Um, so he's saying here, okay, the, the, these, these scenarios that are from the original article have problems. Um, the likely answer is that it was not formed inland nor at the base of a particular tree, all right? This wasn't a tree that then dropped amber down to the ground. As previously discussed in Creation, the same journal that he's writing in himself, 
evolutionary researchers, again, use, use of the word evolutionary is tossed around all the time in the young earth creationist literature, um, have made a significant discovery that resin flowing from hands-on cut in swamp forest trees can entrap aquatic organisms in the swamp water. This research, then he's saying, is tied in with the global flood. All right, so if, if, if there's this other paper that shows that if you uh, cut a particular type of tree uh, in a swamp and it bleeds out, all right, this resin, and the resin is underwater, there are, there are aquatic organisms that can get themselves trapped in that resin, and we've actually observed that. And so you can have a tree outside of the water produce uh, resin that traps aquatic insects. <laughs> I went and I looked at that article. Um, not the creation, I looked at the creation one, but then I followed that back to the original article. And that original article, yeah, it was quite clear. We're talking about Louisiana uh, uh, estuary, um, marine contact regions. Uh, and resin can ooze down trees and can get into the water and aquatic organisms can get trapped in it. I thought to myself the first time, as soon as I read it, I thought, well, okay, so what, this, what you're doing is you're referring to an article that shows that right now, today, under today's conditions, not a global chaotic flood, what is happening right here today, we can see that resin produced in a tree can also trap aquatic organisms in it. Um, so that resin could easily trap insects and then also trap aquatic organisms in it when it falls in below the water. I thought all he's done is provide a, uh, uh, all he's done is actually provide a reference and evidence that makes this particular fossil not really that remarkable. It makes it something that we can observe today. So why not believe it can happen in the past? Why does a global flood have to be engaged to explain this particular fossil? I mean, he continues and says, "Well, oh, okay, the Bible is the key to explain this fossil. In the initial stages of the flood, there would have been massive uprooted trees." violently torn off and broken. They would have released large amounts of tree resin. This sticky resin would have engulfed small organisms and so forth. And that's how you got this ultra rare ammonite uh, in this particular piece of resin. In this explanation, we would expect to find more marine organisms in resin rather than uh, insects and other things from terrestrial environments though. And we also wouldn't expect to find all this resin just in one region in Myanmar. Uh, in between layers of coal uh, and sedimentary layers showing that there is this mixture of ocean and land in a very organized fashion, not a chaotic global event. Right? So none of the geological context fits this explanation. And he's already shown that you can get marine and terrestrial organisms in the same piece of resin in today's environment, under today's conditions. So why does this particular fossil point us to a global flood? I mean, he's more than really saying it's pointing us to a flood. This is evidence of, uh, of a global flood. And he's saying evolutionist scientists can't explain this. They're scratching their heads. How can we do this? How can we possibly explain it? He provides the explanation himself in his own article for it. Uh, let's see if Tim Clary fares any better. All right, so Tim Clary writes for the Institute for Creation Research. Uh, based in Texas, uh, ICR. And he wrote an article around the same time um, uh, that Robinson wrote his article, mind-blowing marine ammonite in tree resin. And then he asked the question, can a single fossil showcase the immense power of a global flood? One such revelatory fossil may have recently been found in Myanmar, encased in beautiful golden Cretaceous amber. Right? Secular scientists are scrambling to come up with an adequate explanation for its existence. Well, I think Robinson already provided a, a reasonable explanation for its existence. I think I provided a rational explanation that doesn't that, that, uh, for this particular fossil. But he adds something else to the story that I think that um, goes beyond is more than just reinterpreting the evidence. He's misinterpreting the evidence or misleading his audience to believe something that's to believe something about the evidence that doesn't exist. All right? In other words, he's he's going to report his facts incorrectly. Uh, and that's why I want to highlight this one as well. Um, how could ocean dwelling mollusks get trapped in tree resin and become a fossil? 
as I said already, I mean, this is just a shell. Shells can be washed up on shore, and they can be washed farther inland uh, by a rare, like a tsunami, which is a rare but not impossible event, and a tsunami is not necessarily a worldwide event, right? There's local tsunamis. Uh, he uses this quote on the next page. He's quoting from National Geographic from somebody who's talking about this particular fossil find. This extraordinary assemblage, a true and beautiful snapshot of a beach in the Cretaceous. That's what I'm describing it as. This is a beach in the Cretaceous, or near a beach in the Cretaceous. is just mind-blowing. That's where he gets his mind-blowing thing. Um, oh my gosh, I would probably have to say that I don't know how that would happen because amber is from trees. How is that going to get a, into a marine environment to entomb a living, moving cephalopod? But I don't know. Right? So then, he, then he's saying, yes, this specimen is truly extraordinary and ammonizing. You know, and mind-blowing. <laughs> ammonizing. Truly mind-blowing. Now, that got me wondering. Like, so what was this, this quote? I don't understand this quote because I read the original paper. And the original paper... It talked about how this was not a living cephalopod. This was the shell, the remains of a cephalopod. Uh, and so this, am, this, this resin doesn't have to drop down into the ocean and get down into deeper layers of water in order to somehow entrap a living ammonite. All it has to do is get around a shell, and a shell doesn't have to be in the water. Uh, so I wondered, like, what was that person referring to? Is that, I mean, did they not understand the paper either? And uh, so I went and I looked at the National Geographic article. All right, this ancient sea creature fossilized in tree resin. How did that happen, right? And, I mean, this article is actually talking about how did that happen. And here we go. Here's our quote. Um, oh my gosh, I probably have to say I don't know how that would happen because amber is from trees. How is that going to happen in a marine environment to entomb a living, moving cephalopod? But I don't know. Hmm, let's go to the paragraph before. Context is really important here. Despite centuries of research, many mysteries still surround ammonites. For one, there are precious few ammonite fossils that present traces of their soft tissues, making it difficult to reconstruct their bodies. Now that we know their discarded shells can fossilize in amber, Researchers may be able to hold out hope for an even unlikelier find, a freshly washed up ammonite stuck in resin and preserved for the ages. In other words, we would love to find an ammonite stuck in amber because then we'd actually get to see it face to face, right? There's the, there's, the, there's the soft tissue, the part of the body we really want to know what the ammonite looked like. All we have is its shells. Um, and so we would love to see that. And so this person is responding to that idea, saying, oh, but how would that happen? That's going to be a lot more difficult than what we see here. In other words, what we see here is just a shell. It's not that hard to explain how it came to be in this piece of resin. What would be more difficult, it would be absolutely wonderful, but I'm not really expecting to find it because it's much less likely that an ammonite is going to get washed up on shore that's living and stay alive long enough without decaying before this amber falls on it and preserves it. And then, of course, that particular, sorry, amber, that resin falls on it. And, of course, that resin has to fall in a place in which it gets covered by another flood quickly enough that it gets preserved, right? So there's a lot of events that have to occur. And so, yes, it is a, that's a very unlikely uh, event. Um, Clary only includes this part, this quote. And so he's going to leave his audience thinking that that this marine environment and this terrestrial environment are being brought together as living organisms in those two environments are being brought together, which seems so unlikely that he's going to say a global flood that's chaotic is the only thing that could do that. I, don't see, I still don't see why even a local tsunami couldn't do that. I mean, all you've done is evidence that marine and terrestrial environments got mixed sometime in the past. That's all you really have here. Uh, not that a massive global flood had to do it. Um, you know, but Clary comes back and um, he says, this is what we'd expect a global flood to have accomplished to create this ammonite fossil in amber. All right, only the power, only, right? He's feeding his audience these words, 
Only the power and high energy of a global event could explain these fossils and the extraordinary and mind-blowing ammonite in amber. Really? It would take a flood that covered the entire world and had that much energy in order to bring an ammonite shell into contact with resin that already has terrestrial organisms in it? It requires a global flood? Only the power of a global flood could do that? That's a real reach. All right? If he wants to say this could happen in a global flood, and so we want to count that as evidence for a global flood in the past, well, that's fine. But as I said before, there's lots of evidence from where the actual amber is found and preserved that doesn't suggest a global flood environment uh, and a chaotic environment at all. It's very well, quite well organized, actually. Um, nonetheless, taken out of context, you could say, yes, I could see that as a piece of evidence. Is it proof? Is it like, the, that's the only way you could explain it? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, and I think it's a little disingenuous to um, his readers to provide such a, uh, to be so bold and to be so confident um, that this is the only explanation for fossils like this. The fossil record is by nature a, uh, a collection of rare events, right? It's like finding uh, fossilized footprints. Um, any single footprint would be extremely difficult to preserve. And you can think the odds of any footprint that I or any person or any animal on this earth today will get preserved in the fossil record is extraordinary low. So low that you would say, oh, what you'd feel impossible. And yet there are quadrillions of footprints being made. And when you put it in the sense of like out of the quadrillions of fossils being made, uh, footprints being made, what are the chances that none of them get pre preserved? And the answer is actually there's a high likelihood that some of them will preserve, a small number. And so when we find fossils like this, um, there might be thousands of pieces of resin that did trap shells in them on a beach or estuary environment uh, such as this forest was in. Um, and what we would only predict we're going to find a couple of those that are actually preserved and we find them in the rock record. Um, hundreds of tons of amber have been dug up in Myanmar and sold to markets in China for gemstones. Not all of them contain insects. Uh, many of them do and we're finding new things all the time. And these rare events offer us interesting glimpses, I think, into the dynamics of a community and an ecosystem from the past, in this case, the Cretaceous. The types of organisms that are in this piece of amber, the differences of the organisms that are in here compared to those in the present. Sure, there's ants and mites and, and, uh, and snails and, and a variety of things that are in these pieces of amber but they're not the species that we have alive today. And they're consistent with other things found in other parts of rocks from around the world in the Cretaceous. So this does paint a consistent picture of the late, the late world of the Cretaceous period, including even those funky, uh, the, the dinosaur tail with the feathers on it uh, and other animals that have been found in amber. All right, that's my story for this time. Um, I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about uh, Myanmar amber. And uh, I write about similar topics on my blog, naturalhistoria.com. So find me there. And until next time, thanks for listening.